Hello and welcome to our webinar on helping your anxious dog adjust and how to see the world through the eyes of a timid newcomer. We're here with Sunny Weber. She's the author of the book Beyond Fight, Flight or Fight, um, a guide to working with fearful dogs. Um, and you can get this book on Amazon.com. I am your moderator, Jenny Kashnick. I'm the president of the Gray Muzzle Organization. We provide grants to animal shelters and rescues nationwide for senior dog programs. So welcome everyone and I am going to hand this over to Sunny to start her presentation. Welcome. Hi Jenny. Thanks for allowing me to contribute to your cause of assisting senior dogs and the people who love them. Today we're going to be addressing fear in dogs, which is the number one impediment to our relationships with them. Everything we discuss today can be applied to senior dogs because they are just as capable of becoming anxious as younger dogs, perhaps more so. Senior dogs can become fearful when A, their nervous systems change and their rational cognitive abilities slow in response to fear stimuli, and two, or B, when lifelong homes change, especially if their human companion dies or is taken from them, such as when people go to assisted living or nursing homes, and the animals are left in either their relatives' houses or relinquished to the chaos of shelter living. Number three, when they are purposely given up for their long time, by their long-time owners because their physical, psychological, and cognitive needs become, quote, too difficult, unquote, or too expensive. Senior dogs deserve the same compassion and respect as any other dogs, perhaps more so. For after years of devotion, all too many are abandoned and they must need to be surrounded by those who have loved, they've loved, and depended upon. Fortunately, many adopters look for senior dogs to adopt. They are beyond the destructive puppy times when what you see is what you get physically, and yet their personalities and sweet temperaments are easily seen at one. An adopter doesn't need to wait a year or two to be sure what they have. So let's begin. My book, Beyond Flight or Fight is a compassionate guide for working with fearful dogs, whether they are questionably bred with reactive personalities or if they, become, they have become fearful due to neglect, abuse, or downright cruelty. Such dogs are from puppy mills, hoarders, dog fight organizations, and other dubious sources. When they arrive in rescues and shelters, most of their histories are unknown. My book is about developing trust between those poor dogs and the people who try to help them. My background is over 25 years of working in the animal welfare world. And when I began my professional career in dog training, my goal was to save dogs from euthanasia and help them find quality homes. I was on the ground floor when positive reinforcement training evolved into dog, in dog obedience schools. I saw how we could help dogs understand what we asked of them and how they would willingly comply when we understood how to motivate them without bullying and talking. Nowhere were these techniques better suited than with the fearful dogs I fostered. For all the myriad reasons dogs became timid, saving their lives depended upon helping them fit into the human world. Removing fear and helping these sad creatures find peace in the company of a human adopter became my goal. I had found my true calling. My goal with my book and all the work I do with fearful dogs is to share what I have learned about working with them during the last 25 years. I want to contribute the techniques I've been taught, learned through trial and error, and those I've developed on my own. I hope to provide concise shortcuts to knowledge that were not known when I started. My book is not a step-by-step -step training manual. This book is about relationships, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Building trust between a fearful dog and trainer. When there is trust between a dog and their person, lives will be saved, and they will have quality. Although trust erodes fear, trust can be an elusive goal, especially for those animals who have never experienced kindness. Fear in dogs is the most common problem behavior that causes people to reject them. Throughout my book and throughout this webinar, we will look at the nature of fear in dogs and learn how we can understand this powerful impediment to our relationships with them. We will examine detailed ways to establish trust through kindness and communication through awareness. We will dissect all the ways people can seem overwhelming and threatening to dogs who, for various reasons, feel alienated from the human world they are forced to inhabit. 
In the end, we will have knowledge and tools to help dogs fit and to become the companions people have treasured for thousands of years. Some things to understand, all dogs have the potential to become fearful, regardless of their backgrounds, their sociability, or their breeding. Dogs are always aware that people are key to every resource they need. Food, water, shelter, companionship, and most of all their freedom. All dogs' requirements and needs are not in their control to obtain. Charles Darwin, the explorer, wildlife illustrator, creator of the theory of evolution, and one of the first to study animal behavior, cited six primary emotions in higher brain creatures. He defined higher brain creatures as animals that can have an explicit capacity for empathy, logic, language, and magnanimity. Magnanimity. <laughs> the six primary emotions he defined were happiness, surprise, sadness, anger, disgust, and fear. Dogs fulfill all of Darwin's descriptions of higher brain creatures, and they will be our focus in this webinar. Sensitive, intelligent, and intensely aware of their surroundings, dogs experience all of Darwin's primary emotions. Fear in dogs is the major reason that dogs are surrendered to shelters, rescues, sanctuaries, and fears believed to be unworkable result in more rejection of dogs as pets than aggression. Although certain types of aggression are caused by fear. If we can learn more about all the aspects of what makes dogs afraid, we can help them face stimuli that frighten them and create adoptable dogs from the objective risk. We will examine every aspect of fear that I have come across in 25 years of rehabilitating fearful dogs. My goal is to help you, a confused and well-meaning owner or professional dog handler, address the behavior in dogs that causes them turmoil. Our mutual goal is to help them find comfort and home. Building trust with your adopted dog is crucial. It's the key to all relationships between any and all species. With trust, dogs can relax and know the resources they consider valuable will be provided. Those resources can be food, water, shelter, and play. Although trust erodes fear, trust can be an elusive goal, especially for those animals who have never experienced illness. Fear in dogs is the most common problem that causes dogs to reject them. Stops in our walk to building dog confidence. Understanding the nature of fear in dogs. Fear is the most powerful impediment to our relationships. We need to learn to establish trust through kindness and communication through our awareness of how our dogs see the world and how they see us through our body language and our treatment of them. Discuss the ways that people, we are going to discuss the ways that people can feel overwhelming and threatening to dogs throughout this webinar. Fear in dogs. Fear in dogs is a major reason that dogs are surrendered to shelters, rescues, and sanctuaries, as we've said. We can help them face stimuli that frighten them and create adoptable dogs from rejected misfits. Fearful, shy, and timid dogs can be saved and have quality lives free of anxiety and filled with peace. The emotions that Darwin talked about are based in the primitive limbic areas of the dog's brain, deep in the amygdala section. Let's take a look at the dog's brain. As you can see, the amygdala is deep in the center of the primitive brain, and those are called the limbic areas. Primary emotions, such as fear, are automatic and require no rational thinking to cause physiological and psychological reaction. Fear results from exposure to any stimulus or object, a stimulus is an object or situation. Any stimulus that is perceived by the brain as a threat to survival. The immediate rush of stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, 
set off the rapid and instant reflexive responses Darwin coined fight or flight. In a dog, these hormones trigger instantaneous readiness to save yourself from a harmful scenario and quickly seek and find physical and therefore emotional safety. There are two ways a dog can save himself from danger. To engage in aggression to protect himself, which is fight, or to run away, flight. Most dogs prefer to run than fight, so I've changed the order of Darwin's day to flight or fight. Fear as a secondary emotion is conscious thought and is processed in the cerebral cortex. You go back to the brain. The cerebral cortex is in the very front of the brain. It's a large section and it's a higher functioning area of the brain than the primitive amygdala, which is the limbic area or knee jerk reaction area. When a dog bypasses knee jerk reaction fear responses and goes into the cerebral cortex to logic his way through his scenario, it will give him a sense of control over his own environment. And the way we can help the dog is to help him through trust. When he trusts his person and is accustomed to tolerating the experiences, he will automatically overrule his amygdala's limbic messages and bypass emotion to his cerebral cortex for more higher functioning decision making. The ways we can help a dog do that is when they're young, exposing a puppy to a large variety of new stimuli in non traumatic ways during the peak time of brain development. According to Darwin, when fear manifests as a secondary emotion, the conscious thought is processed, like we said, through the cerebral cortex. That's where higher logic dominates reaction. A well socialized, confident, and trained dog of any age will allow proximity of a novel sight, sound, or object. Although all primitive logic is taught him to fear and escape the unknown. A dog who does trust his handler is accustomed to tolerating the experiences and will overrule his amygdala, amygdala's limbic messages and bypass emotion up to the cerebral cortex. New studies continue to show that dogs are able to reason on complex levels of choice, cognitive aspects that were not known during Darwin's time. The vital time for learning the groundwork of building tolerance, like we said, is in the first 12 weeks of a puppy's life. However, what if you miss that time? What if you've adopted an older dog? If you adopt an older dog, you will have more of a challenge in helping them assist, assisting them in the development of cerebral cortex reasoning, but it can be done. Behavior modification programs would have to be developed and implemented slowly to help desensitize the mature dog to fearful and or novel stimuli. If a dog has a conditioned fear response based on previous negative, previous negative experiences, skilled behavior modification will help the dog replace its conditioned fear response with more reasonable tolerance to what was once frightening. But the younger the fearful pup is when behavior modification begins, the better. Also, the smaller the fright the pet experienced when he first learned to fear, the faster and more completely he will habituate to that same stimulus. A program of habituation and desensitization will move forward more slowly and may result in less success when the dog is older and or the fear is more intense. Sometimes fears can be lessened but not completely eliminated. By helping a mature dog learn to think through fear is possible. In this way, fear can be managed even if it is not eliminated. When fearful dogs are successful in transferring themselves from primitive reactions to reasoned and controlled responses, they become more adaptable and therefore more adoptable. Rehabilitators of fearful dogs are capable of saving dog lives and can take pride in the realization that the dog's life will not only be saved, but that life will be more comfortable, peaceful, and rich. Problems with my socialization, let's review that. Oops. You will have a difficult, if not a difficult time helping an older dog catch up, however. 
it can be done to where this dog is adoptable and you will need to find the doctors that are willing to accept the challenges of an older, more careful dog. The reason is, by the time hardwiring is very definitely set in the brain, which is through breeding, behavioral modification programs will need to help the dog learn to control his anxiety, if it, even if it does not eliminate it. Learn fear is experience-based. You can teach your dog how to replace its conditioned fear responses with more reasonable tolerance of fear stimuli. That is called nature versus nurture in the animal world. Most fear is based in both nature or breeding and nurture, which is experience-based. The challenge is to build trust between the dog and you to allow time for trust to override the strength of the fear-based survival instincts, which we also call major reaction. And once again, to repeat, younger dogs and smaller fright experiences will be faster and more completely habituated to. The small spheres may be fun, but larger ones can only be managed. The confident dog who accomplishes the ability to change his own behavior, therefore going from limbic knee-jerk reactions to reasoned responses, or even figuring out if a fear response is necessary to respond to at all, the dog will feel empowered. He will gain self-confidence in judging his own environment. Therefore, he can calm himself, passing major reactions from the amygdala to the cerebral cortex on his own. He will then investigate and determine his own action, what needs to be done to approach or to deal with psychologically whatever first in life he is facing. He can transfer himself from the amygdala to the cerebral cortex brain function once he has confidence. And the handler is key to helping the dog develop that ability. Helping your adopted fearful dog adjust. To begin with, life structure. In a fearful dog's life, life structure is crucial to the establishment of comfort, relaxation, anxiety relief, and only then can the animal begin to learn how to cope with his or her own fears. Once the dog's anxiety level is dropped, the dog can feel safe in her routine, and learning can begin. Small departures from that routine in time, type, and intensity will be less stressful because the animal understands that she can and will eventually return to her set routine. Gradual departures from routine, once that structure has been established, is, is very important. And part of the things that help a dog deal with fear in life structure are safe places. Many, many fearful dogs will choose their own safe places. When they do this, it can be the corner of a couch, it can be a stair, it can be under a table. Make sure that the dog is never frightened in her chosen safe place. When the dog learns that one place is safe, they can take that generalization to other places eventually. And those safe places must be respected by every human family member or anyone who comes into your home. If the dog immediately goes to the safe place, recognize the stress, and make sure that she is not challenged there. A safe place is a baseline building block in environmental comfort. They will eventually understand that the world on a larger scale is safer once they are safe and protected in an initial safe place. The first step in earning the dog's trust is to honor that safe place. And when the dog realizes that a small space in the world is safe, their perspective of safety will expand to new areas. Often safe places are outskirts areas of family activity. And let her tell you when you're ready to, when she is ready to venture forth and interact. Never force a fearful dog into a scenario that they are not ready to handle. Seeking her safe place will allow the dog the ability to decompress when she feels overwhelmed in her new environment. Access to and providing resources. Dogs have their own priorities as to what resources they are most important to them. 
you know, get to know your own God and know what your God values. In the beginning, you can divine them into physical needs and non-physical needs. Physical needs are things like who they prefer, where they prefer to eat it, um, types of water stations, some like high, some like low, some like bubbles, some like stationary. They also need to have bedding. They'll pick their own resting areas, and you should allow that, especially if it's considered a safe place to the dog. The non-physical needs, companionship, being able to trust, being able to feel safe. It's up to us to provide these needs and these valuable resources to our dog. Each dog will tell you, if you're careful and you're aware of your pet, what value, what value she puts on any given physical or non-physical offering you make. Deprivation of resources can manifest in problem behavior, anxiety-based phobias, insecurities, physical ailments, and difficulty in decision making. Because once the dog is stressed, the stress hormones shut off reasoning and the dog cannot learn. So it's very crucial to let your dog tell you what she needs as a resource so that you can provide it and lower the stress hormones so that she can begin to learn. It is easier to meet a dog's needs than correct problems later. Problem behaviors caused by anxiety, insecurity, physical ailments, difficulty in making decisions are easier to avoid than to correct later. When a dog's physical and emotional needs are met and continue to be met over long periods of time, her immune system strengthens. The dog's personality flowers. She develops deep trust and a profound connection to you. It is easier, kinder, and simpler to address dog's needs than to deal with if I correct problems due to neglect or cruelty after the other third. Common body language. What a dog reads in our posture and movement may not be the message we wish to send. Owners mistaken accusations of a dog ignoring or rebelling their commands can result in a dog's rejection. People rarely associate their own body language with their dog's medicine behavior. Clarity for dogs is nonverbal body language. They either do not understand the verbal command or see human body language as a clearer message. A confused dog will seek to return human peaceful coexistence between the person and herself. Human inconsistency is emotionally disturbing to all dogs. Verbal language. Effective use of your voice as a tool. This is important as collars, leashes, food, toys, environmental controls. The voice is a very underrated tool. And you always have your voice with you. You don't always have a whistle. You don't always have a clicker. Indeed, sound markers, noise markers such as those can be very stressful to a sound sensitive to dog. And when we're dealing with elderly dogs, they often can't hear those things. They can usually hear some range of your voice, and that is always with you as a tool. Melodic humming versus word chatter equals calming versus confusion. People talk a lot, and it confuses dogs. So I always recommend that you use melodic humming, particularly with a faithful dog. Never walk through your house without letting that dog know where you are, whether or not you're talking to her. But by humming, she can find you. Talking places focus on the dog. People don't understand that when they're talking to the dog, they're looking at the dog, bending over the dog, and timid dogs do not enjoy being focused on. Humming. No response is expected from the dog. It's just simply a noise. And it's a calming if you're using very quiet and soft humming tones. It's really relaxing. And it takes direct attention and pressure off of her. And if you're humming just to yourself, she knows where you are. 
And you're not looking at her and you're not putting pressure on her to respond to you by body posture or direct eye contact. People depend on verbal communications and dogs depend on nonverbal. So if we are going to um, work with our dogs, we need to stay in a nonverbal mode if possible until they are comfortable with our sound. Dogs process the tone, the speed, and the volume in your overall sound, not our words or sentences, unless they are specifically trained to them, which they can do. But in the beginning, especially when you're working with a fearful newcomer, you need to be very conscious of how you are sounding, how you are looking, and to focus on calming sounds, not necessarily words or sentences. Common communication problems. Anthropomorphism. This is a big word for something that humans do all the time, and that means that we assign human emotional cognitive interpretations to animals. So, for example, when your dog does something you say she did out of revenge, that is not the case. Dogs do not operate on that complex level. But dogs can be very sensitive to critical tones of voice. Contempt and disgust are basic emotions that Darwin discovered most animal species share cognitively with humans. Dogs do not understand the use of derision, but seem to understand the negativity of verbal derision, such as ridicule, ridicule aimed at them. When a dog is ridiculed, he appears to be embarrassed. Dropped head and submissive posture to appease are common reactions to verbal criticism. Whether they understand what criticism is or not, they understand the negativity of it. When dogs sense disapproval, they may cower or slip away. Hence, the anthropomorphic misconception, he knew we'd been bad. Disdainful verbal criticism is inhumane and pointless. The dog will not associate derision with his own behavior. He will only interpret you as unpredictable, which will lead to more fear, not confidence and trust in you. People are insensitive to what they subliminally say to their dog, but their dog is constantly aware of how you appear, you sound, and you express yourself through movement. Leadership. Very, very important aspect of relationships with dogs. Dogs are hierarchical and they are pack members. Working with fearful dogs requires you to be a steady, trustworthy leader. This leadership role takes the pressure of the unknown off the dog, allowing him to feel less threatened by the unfamiliar world he has emerged, he has entered, where people have power over all life-sustaining resources, such as food, water, shelter, safety, and companionship. Dogs are inherently social and look for leadership and is physically and psychologically safe. Insecure dogs have an even greater need for kind but definite leadership. When a dog's leader is absent or ceases to act as a leader, anxiety produces destructive behaviors or symptoms that something is amiss in the dog's emotional life. Increased confidence builds through trust, which equals development of the dog's true personality will help this dog accept your leadership and follow you in a devoted way through any challenge you ask of them. Guidance and support of a confident leader will help the dog find his place in its family pack and in the whole of human society. If a dog is disciplined for something he did wrong without being taught what the appropriate behavior is, he becomes abused, confused and afraid. Benevolent leadership with proper and confident behavior, leadership, a dog develops confidence in his own behavior. Human behavior is complex, even to other humans. As intuitive and aware as most dogs are in an attempt to understand people, they often end up more confused. 
lack of consistency in human behavior is the most common and most, most confusing for dogs. Confusion will sprout into fear. Human behavior is rife with nuance, subliminal messages, and ulterior motives, all of which are impossible for dogs to unravel. When their human leader behaves in ways that a dog cannot interpret, fear is often the result. The ignorant owner often punishes the dog when the dog is only confused, not deliberately disobeying. Dog behaviors based on the dog's desire are, are based on the dog's desire to avoid punishment and are often misinterpreted by his people. Watch and listen. Your dog will tell you how she is receiving the information you have transmit. Watch the speed of the comprehension and customize your approach. Never punish. Always guide the dog with positive rewards and lots of praise. And make it praise the dog value. If you have a fearful dog, do not be rambunctious and loud and handle her roughly. Sometimes fearful dogs need quiet, soft praise and bubbly voice sounds, not loud sounds. Remain open to the possibility that her own path is the best for her. If she takes a certain behavioral path that you have not asked for, stop and think, is this necessary for her in her own comfort level? This is especially true for dogs with cognitive difficulties or physical difficulties. If you're asking for a behavior that is physically painful, or un be unable to be done by the dog, watch her and listen to what she's trying to tell you and pay attention to the messages she's trying to send. She must have confidence that when she behaves in ways she has been trained to believe are appropriate, that she will gain your approval. You must be attentive, trustworthy, and consistent. Advocacy and protection from fear. Intervene when your dog does not know how to deal with a situation or a thing. Do not let your dog flounder in fear. New do every new dog needs time to learn what you expect, emotional and physical support, and protection from their fear triggers. This is especially true of senior dogs who adjust slower and are far more needy of confidence building from their people especially if they lived a long, comfortable life with someone and has recently lost that comfort zone. You are the resource for all the things that your dog values. If stressed, when your dog does not see a stressful reaction in you, she will use other skills that you've taught her for self-confidence. So this is another reason why you must always be aware of the sound of your voice and the body language you're imparting. Because if you are not at reacting stressful to a situation, she will mimic you or watch you closely and will learn what she needs to be responsive to. We are a dog's advocates when they are facing our world. Listen and observe your dog when she tries to communicate to you in her own language, especially when she is in a scenario that she does not feel comfortable in. Watch her discomfort and do not force her to face things that she does not feel ready to face. Unsure dogs also seek out other dogs to learn from and emulate. So a helper dog, a more confident dog, an older dog, sometimes even a younger dog for older dogs who are insecure, can help you in your task to begin communication with your new insecure dog. But remember, your first loyalty must always be to your dog. There are many situations that you may find yourself in, such as walking in the park when people allow an off-leash dog to come up and harass your on-leash dog. If your dog does not enjoy that kind of interaction, you need to intervene and tell the other person to get that dog away. Do not worry about your own embarrassment. Your first loyalty must be to your dog, always. Training in secure dogs. Neotenized. Neoteny is a word that we use when we say we are keeping something in an immature state. And all dogs are this way. They are independent and they require consistent family structure, often called their path. Dogs never completely emotionally mature and are in constant need of parental guidance, which is you. Be firm, forgiving, 
protective and kind like you would to your feeding child. Use encouragement and praise. Dominant submissive theories have been debunked. Use the ABCs of learning theory instead. Antecedent behavior and consequence. There are many, many good books about that. We do talk about that in my book to some degree. And this is very important with fearful, insecure dogs. And don't believe that old dogs can't learn new tricks because they can, especially in the confidence arena and in behavior. Positively reinforce proper behaviors and ignore the negative ones. Negative ones do not need to be responded to. Interrupt the negative behavior instead with a noise marker. A noise marker is could be a clicker, it could be a whistle, it could be a clap, it could be your voice going ah ah, and then redirect and reward. You can't stop a negative behavior and that not redirect the dog to become confused, and eventually they will learn to ignore you. Even fearful dogs will learn to ignore you. So always interrupt the negative behavior, and then redirect to positive and desired behavior and then reward. Reward-based interactions are more successful at increasing communication, controlling behavior reliably, and lessening fear in dogs. When you reward, the dog learns not to be afraid of you. You also get more controlled behavior because a dog who wants to engage in negative behavior will do so when you're not there. But if this dog has been continuously and reliably reinforced in a positive way, that negative behavior will eventually distinguish itself because it receives no reinforcement. Unpredictability in human behavior is considered to any dog. Be conscious and consistent. We cannot afford not to be aware of how your dog is seeing you. When you're working with training, especially with fearful dogs, but with all dogs, punishment should never be used. Physical or emotional punishment is rationalized cruelty. Rationalized cruelty. That means that you are being cruel to your pet, and you are rationalizing it by saying, this dog is doing something I don't want him to do, and he did it anyway. They do not understand rationalized cruelty. And it's also a hidden desire for control. People have our hierarchical also, and they have huge needs for control. But you cannot do this to a dog who don't understand it. It only feeds more fear. Punishment does not teach anything but fear. The responses based in coercion will disappear when the threat is neutralized or absent. Dogs do not learn to perform a request out of a desire to dogs do not learn to perform a request out of a desire to obtain a reward. Therefore, the performance is unreliable when it's based in punishment. If you use positive interactions with your dog and correct the negative behavior, you have something to reward. So the, the correction can be, as we said, a noise marker, a physical marker like a clap. Um, a voice like, ah, ah, or stop that. The goal is to stop the dog, what she's doing, and then to look for you for further guidance. Correction is not punishment. Correction cues can be used safely without causing fear, and they interrupt inappropriate behavior and provide an opportunity for learning. And as we said, if the dog is in a fearful state, as you would get with punishment, that learning cannot take place because stress hormones are blocking the ability of the brain to process. If you use positive reinforcement correction and redirection, the ability to learn remains open. Correction, redirection of the combination teaches an appropriate behavior that is reliable and ongoing. Here are some tips for working with timid dogs Ignore, again, the negative behavior. Show her an alternative positive behavior that she can be rewarded for. Positive interaction, verbal praise, speed treats, even physical praise, strokes and scratches in her favorite place. 
they're positive reinforcement. And that increases the likelihood the behavior will reoccur. Negative interaction, yelling, hitting, is negative reinforcement, also increases the likelihood the behavior will occur. Reinforcement is reinforcement, whether it's positive or negative, both positive and negative. Reinforcement will increase the likelihood of behaviors reoccurring. The most profound correction a dog can receive is silence. The dog will seek to re-engage. We talk about this a lot in my book, about how you use silence to get a dog to stop a negative behavior. Seek re-engagement, wherein you can redirect the behavior and reward it. Immediate redirection must follow the correction. Teach the desirable behavior and reward. Oops. Fearful dogs are not only afraid of things, people, and situations. They are afraid to make their own decisions about their own behavior. Our goal is to help build their confidence to the point where they can make confident decisions and feel good about their own self-empowerment. Teach success. Do not set your dog up for failure. Finish each training session on a positive note. You'll find this in every dog training manual you can across. In conclusion, Saving dogs' lives depends on people, the rescuer, the foster, family, the rehabilitator, and the adopter. We all play crucial roles. For most professional dog people, there are no degrees, no certificates, no titles to place at the end of your name on a business card. Yet you should take time to reflect on what you've accomplished each time a dog finds a loving home for a lifetime after you work with her. When you open your heart and home to a foster dog who is fearful, know that you are saving that dog's life. Most fearful dogs languish in commercial facilities. Their sensitive natures cannot tolerate the overstimulation of impersonal and often overcrowded kennels. Timid dogs need personal attention, quiet, routine, and a familiar person interactive. They cannot thrive without the intimate trust that a home environment can provide. You, therefore, as a foster person, are the key that is crucial to the happy endings these types of dogs can find. <coughs> for those who adopt and give homes to dogs rejected by others for their quirks, there are no medals or clues. If you've adopted a fearful dog and committed your heart and life to her, you should be proud of the fact that you are among the caring cadre of adopters who take on this challenging and rewarding role. All of us are important cogs in the wheel that moves the jagged line of human evolution upwards. You are an integral part of a quiet, peaceful army of kind, compassionate, loving people who were called to this special and imperative work. You have made a difference and you have saved God's lives. Thank you very much for caring and thank you for listening to our webinar. Thank you, Sunny, for this uh, valuable information, and thank you all for taking an interest in this really important topic. For more information and resources on this subject, just go to sunnyweber.com, and again, you can find her book on Amazon or more information about it on her website. So for more information on senior dogs and or the Gray Muzzle Organization, you can just go to graymuzzle.org. So um, enjoy your senior dog or dogs if you're like me and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day everyone. Thank you.